my pleasure and privilege to be with you all this evening. We appreciate everybody who's here. We have <coughs> visitors from surrounding congregations and perhaps from the community as well. And we're thankful for all of you as well as the members of this congregation. Each of you who have made a sacrifice and an effort to be here tonight, you've helped make the meeting a success and certainly have encouraged me and I hope you feel blessed uh, for our being here together. We're going to be reading from the book of Romans, the 7th chapter, beginning in verse 9. Romans chapter 7, beginning in verse 9. The Apostle Paul says, I was alive once without the law. When the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. These are difficult words, hard to understand in some respect, and uh, they describe a difficult subject. The subject we have named here on the board, what we sometimes call the age of accountability. We're going to look into the Bible and study not only the scriptures we've just read, but others related to this theme to learn more about what it means and what the Bible says regarding it. Before we go any further, we have a wonderful opportunity to pray together. And we invite you to humble yourselves as a selected brother leads us in prayer. As created beings, we're different from God in so many ways. We are limited where he is unlimited. We're not all powerful or all knowing. We're not everywhere all the time. We're limited in all of our abilities and capacities. But as human beings, we're different from every other part of creation. We're different from rocks and water because we have life. We're different from vegetables and plants because we have a mind. We're different from animals because we have an immortal spirit. And we're different from angels because we have an organic body. And because we have an organic body, we go through two remarkable experiences. We are born and we die. And between birth and death, if our lives are not cut short, we grow in size and in understanding. As the Bible says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. Now as created beings with a mind and a spirit, God has some expectations of us that he does not have of all creation. He expects us to have a relationship with him of love and trust and obedience. He's given us the amazing ability to make moral decisions by free will. Because we have that ability, God holds us responsible and accountable if we fail to use it properly. Now if a tree falls on a man and kills him, nobody's going to arrest that tree and take it to the courthouse for a trial. Now, people will say that's an accident. The tree didn't mean to do it. If a dog bites a man, maybe even kills him, now, people will probably say that dog ought to be put down because it's dangerous. But people aren't going to accuse the dog <coughs> of murder because the dog doesn't have the ability to think about issues in that way. But if a man kills another man, the Bible says he deserves to die and go to hell because he's sinned. Genesis chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. And that's what we're talking about when we use this word accountability. A person who is able mentally and physically and spiritually to from the heart and with the mind obey or to disobey God's law is accountable to it. When such a one sins, he or she deserves death and everlasting punishment. And the Bible teaches that under normal circumstances, every man and woman becomes accountable to God's law at some point in time. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20. But the question we want to consider for a little while this evening is at what point does a person reach that age or that state of accountability? 
According to Scripture, all men and women are born into this world in a condition of innocence, pure of heart, and free from all sin. I say the Bible teaches that. Uh, religious groups don't always teach it. Most people in the religious world today, in fact, deny that, but the Bible teaches it very plainly. When a child is conceived and formed in the womb of its mother, its body comes from the genetic contribution of its parents. But the spirit does not come from mother or father or any human uh, ancestor. The spirit of every child comes from God. In Zechariah 12 and verse 1, the Bible says that the Lord formed the spirit of a man within him. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 9, the writer of Hebrews talks about the fathers of our flesh. Now, as far as the flesh is concerned, I have my father and you have your father. But then there is the father of all spirits, according to the same passage. Spiritually, we all have the same father, and that's God, who created our spirit and put it within us. And because the spirit comes from God and not from mother and father, it has no problems. Now, because I am related to my mom and dad, I've inherited some issues from them. I might have a propensity for diabetes or cancer or heart disease or something like that. But my spirit came from God, as did yours. And when it was given, it was as pure and flawless as God who gave it. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 7. So in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 12 and 15, when the prophet was delivering an oracle against the king of Tyre, he says, You were perfect in your ways from the day when you were created until iniquity was found in you. Now this king was a wicked man. So evil, in fact, that when the Bible describes him, as you read what the Bible says, many readers think uh, the Scripture is talking about Satan. He had so much in common with the devil, it's easy to confuse one for the other. But he wasn't always wicked. The prophet says he was born innocent until iniquity was found in him. Like all people, he was created in perfection without sin. Now, it's reasonable to think about that, that a baby would have no sin, because sin is defined in the Bible as disobeying the law of God. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Now, a baby does not have the mental or physical or spiritual abilities to obey or disobey God's law or even to know what God's law is. In fact, a baby doesn't even have the ability to know that God exists. A baby doesn't have an abstract awareness of uh, himself or herself. It's impossible to literally conceive of a baby as a sinner. Now I say literally because there are some passages of Scripture in the Bible where Bible writers are using the language of poetry. They're not being literal. They're using maybe exaggerated language or figurative language. And sometimes people try to take that language literally even though it's absurd. For example, in Psalm 58 and verse 3, David said, The wicked are estranged from the mother's womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. Now, is that true? Well, it's true, in as much as the writer of Scripture intended it to mean what he intended it to mean. But is it literally true? Of course not. Nobody is speaking as soon as he's born. Lies or otherwise. This is a poetic exaggeration. and It's common in the poetry of the Bible. In Job chapter 31 and verse 18. You remember the story of Job? How God allowed him to suffer all kinds of afflictions as a test of his faith. And in the time of his greatest suffering, some people came to him, some friends. And they tried to comfort him. And in the course of that comfort, they tried to explain to him why he was suffering. And they accused him of all kinds of sin. And one of the sins they accused him of was not taking care of widows and orphans. And in response to that accusation, in Job 31, 18, Job said, From my youth I have reared the orphan as a father, and from my mother's womb 
I died in the window. Now, if you take that literally, the Job saying he operated the nursing home as a fetus. I don't think anybody believes that. I think everybody thinks this is a form of poetry. It's just a figured speech. And he's saying, as we might say today, well, I've been doing that all my life. I've been doing that as long as I can remember. And that's what David was saying about people who become heinous sinners. You don't get that way overnight, but you start that kind of a career in criminality early in life. It's poetry. And some of the Bible is written in poetry. But when the Bible is speaking literally, we're consistently informed that the infant is not guilty of sin. In fact, the Bible gives plain assurance that those who die in infancy go to heaven. They go to paradise without any need for some special ceremony or rite being performed on them simply because they are innocent. Remember the story of David and Bathsheba. David had an adulterous affair with her, and through that affair, a child was conceived. And that baby died shortly after he was born. And when the child died, David, who was a prophet, said in 2 Samuel 12 and 23, but now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Now David anticipated that one day he was going to be reunited with his baby. And I want you to know that that hope of reunion rests only on the anticipation that David and that baby were both going to heaven. If David went to heaven and the baby went to hell, David would not be reunited with him. If both of them went to hell, they wouldn't be reunited because hell is never described as a place of reunion. It's always a place of separation, anguish, and torment. There'd be no joy to that. Only if both of them were going to heaven would he hope to see his child again. And that's where David expected to spend his eternity, he said in Psalm 23 and verse 6. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And that's where he looked forward to meeting his child again. <laughs> this baby was illegitimate, born out of an adulterous affair. If it was possible to inherit sin, this one would have plenty to inherit. But David the prophet declares that the little one went to paradise. He knew what Ezekiel knew when he wrote in 18 and 20 of his book, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father. Neither shall the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. But you know there are some preachers and religious teachers today who try to spin the innocent behavior of babies as being sinful. I've got a tract in my library at home written by a denominational preacher who believes babies are born sinners. And he said in that tract, babies are immodest, selfish, lazy, mean, inconsiderate, and rude. Who could deny the evil in their hearts? Well, he's got a point. I've got a baby. She's three now. She's not a baby anymore. But she went through babyhood like everybody else. And I've loved her from the moment I laid eyes on her. I loved her before I ever saw her. But you know, she's pretty immodest. And most babies are. I've been in a house visiting with someone, talking about the Bible, and there's a baby. Runs through the living room without a stitch of clothes on. And here I am, a preacher. And that baby's not embarrassed. He's just got a big smile on his face. Running around. Immodest. And I tell you, they are lazy. I've never known one had a job. They just lay around. They don't do anything. It's all, and they're selfish. It's all about them. If they want to eat in the middle of the night, they'll wake up the whole house screaming and crying and hollering. They're rude. I'll be holding one sometimes. I try to be kind to them. I'll pick one up and tell it how cute it is, and it'll just uh, spit all over my new tie. And they're, they're mean. Sometimes they're mean. We've got a whole herd of them back home in Tulsa. And sometimes they'll run around and you think, oh, they're, they're friends. And then all of a sudden one's bit the other one, thrown them into a wall. Why, it's true. They've got all these bad behaviors. But of course, you might say, well, Clint, don't be so hard on them. They're just babies. That's right. They're just babies. 
And they do all those things, but they don't know what they're doing. They don't realize the way we do the uh, nature of those concepts. And so if we understand that, certainly God understands that. God who created us. Well, we know that he does. Because over in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 11, God told Jonah that he did not want to destroy the city of Nineveh because in that city were 120,000 souls who did not know between their right hand and their left hand. That means they couldn't tell right from wrong. And that was an old figure speech among the Hebrews to talk about infants and little children. In Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 39, when God was punishing the Israelites for their faithlessness at Kadesh Barnea, he specifically said, your little ones will be exempted from punishment because they did not have knowledge of good and evil. In Isaiah 7 and verse 16, we read about a little boy, less than four or five years old, and God said that he did not know how to refuse the good, uh, the evil, and choose the good. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 14, the Apostle Paul was talking to Christians who thought maybe they ought to divorce their spouse if the spouse was an unbeliever because they were afraid having an unbeliever or a sinner in the family might defile the Christian. And the Apostle Paul reasons that that was not Necessary. That fear was unfounded because otherwise, he says, your children would be unclean. After all, they've got you for parents. But he says, in fact, they are holy. So Paul affirms here the understanding that all ancient Christians considered infants were clean and pure. In spite of the fact that their parents might be sinners or even unbelievers. You see, God does not hold Babies and infants are countable. But even after infancy, one does not automatically become accountable. And I think we all know this in secular matters. Uh, we know that across this nation of ours, from state to state, uh, there are ages that determine how old a person has to be if they want to get married without parents' consent. Because we know that children are not always capable of appreciating the weight of their actions. There is a certain age in which the federal government says anyone underneath this age does not have the capacity to consent to an adult relationship. And if a little child kills somebody or commits some sort of a crime, if a young person commits a crime, it will be determined whether they should be tried as an adult or as a minor. And if they're tried as a minor, then their punishment, if they're found guilty, will be much less severe if there's a punishment at all because we know that children are not always capable of appreciating the weight and meaning of their actions. So when a child is growing and begins to understand concepts like modesty and manners and to think uh, abstract thoughts and to realize that it's important to listen to authority figures like mother and father, well, the child might be disobedient, the child might be uh, rebellious against a rule and might even do something that he knows is wrong, like tell a lie or throw a tantrum or steal. It's possible for children to do all of those things, but still not be accountable to God's law. You see, the Bible talks about this stage in a child's life as a time of foolishness. In Proverbs 22 and verse 15, the Bible says foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. Now in this passage, spanking is not viewed as a form of judgment against sin, but a form of discipline, <laughs> of teaching to train the child a better understanding of right and wrong. You want to know why we've got so much crime? So many people who don't respect law enforcement officers and don't respect the government, don't respect God, it's because in that young period of their life, when the Bible says they've got foolishness in their heart, their delinquent and neglectful parents don't discipline them. They let that foolishness stay there and fester and grow, and it never is driven away, because there is no rod of correction. And as they get older, that foolishness turns into evil. Now at this point, it's not evil. It's foolishness. It's a lack of understanding. At this point in a child's life, they begin to be able to believe in something in a very basic sense. 
that they cannot tell the difference between religious faith and make-believe. So they might say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus, and they do. But they also believe in Santa Claus, and they believe a toy train could take them to China, and they believe that a dollhouse and a real house have the same value and nature. At this point, a child can memorize facts, even the facts of the gospel. I'm amazed at what my little girl is able to memorize, but I'm going to use another child as an example. Uh, he's not a little kid anymore. In fact, I think he's a Christian now. <coughs> years ago, I was holding a meeting at Blue Springs, and little Landon Reverend was two years old. And I stayed with Marcus and Danielle, and we'd drive to church. I'd ride with them in their van. And there was little Landon in his car seat in the back of the van. And I'd turn around and I'd say, Landon, what must I do to be saved? And Landon would say, Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. And he's just playing with his toys. Didn't even look up at me. I'd say, Landon, how should I worship? He'd say, In spirit and in truth. I'd say, Landon, where'd you learn that? He'd say, Brother Don King. <laughs> and you think about that. He knew all those things. He was just two. But he had committed all of those things to his memory now. If I had said to him, Landon, what does it mean to repent? What's baptism for? Well, he wouldn't have been able to explain that. He had facts memorized because he was a bright young man. He still is. But at that little age, he didn't understand those concepts, even though he could repeat them. You know, at this age, a child can be afraid of hell. Who wouldn't be? The right preacher comes to town, stomping around up there and talking about fire and pain and worms and darkness. Could scare any child, but the child might also be afraid of a monster under its bed. He doesn't understand the judgment and righteousness of God because these aspects of moral and spiritual character are just developing. But the child is still not accountable for sin. So when does one become accountable? Well, that's a question that is not easily answered. In fact, the language is somewhat problematic because the Bible doesn't give a specific age of accountability. But rather it describes a state, a moral and psychological state. Now, it's true that most people reach this state around the same age, but you know some people have a different maturity. Some people mature much quicker and some people much slower. Some people might reach this age younger. Some people might reach a little older. And some people have mental and emotional challenges and deficiencies that will cause them to never reach this stage, however old they become. But under normal conditions, there comes a time when one is held accountable to God's law. And Paul, the apostle, described it in this text, in Romans 7, 9 through 11, he says there, I was alive once. He doesn't mean physically alive. Obviously, he's physically alive with Romans. He means spiritually alive. I, one time I had spiritual life without the law. That is, when he did not know or understand the law of God morally or psychologically, when he was just a child. But he says, when the commandment came, Sin revived. That word revived literally means it sprang to life. And I died spiritually. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. In that passage, when he talks about sin, he's using it as a figure for the devil. Satan, who tempts us and who leads us into sin. So this is a poetic description that talks about how Paul first became accountable to God's law. When he sinned in this state, he became guilty, spiritually dead, and bound for hell. But what caused the transition from unaccountability to accountability? Well, first consider what it was not, as we just noted. It wasn't simply that Paul did wrong. Or that he started fearing judgment, or even that he learned what God's law said. Why, he was probably like little Landon Reverend. He was raised in a God-fearing and a believing home. And uh, because his parents honored God's word, they would have done what Deuteronomy 6 
verse 7 says parents should do for their children and taught him the word of God from the time he was just a little baby. He probably had facts memorized. He could quote off the Ten Commandments and all manner of things from the Scripture. In fact, I want you to think about this, and it's very important. Do you know that you can be accountable to God even if you don't know one word in the Bible? Even if you've never read the Bible, you can be accountable to live by it. Listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter 2 and verse 12. He says, for as many as have sinned without the law, that is without the Bible, without the scripture, will also perish without the law. But as many as have sinned in the law, having read the scripture or heard the scripture, will be judged by the law. God is no respecter of persons. He shows no partiality there. Jesus says in Luke 12, 47 through 48, that the servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But the one who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, do you expect he'll get off scot-free? Because he didn't know? No, that's not what the Bible says. He shall be beaten with few. From him... Who, to whom much is given, from him will much be required, and to whom much has been committed, to them they will ask the more. And both of these passages tell us that there is enough information in the world around us, in creation, in our own conscience, to make us accountable to God, whether we read the Bible or not. The Apostle Paul says there came a time for him when he knew the difference between truth and make-believe. He said in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 11, when I was a child, I speak as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. When one matures in his understanding to the point that he can look into creation, and on his own he can realize that there must be a creator who made all of this and made me, then that person is at that moment accountable to give the creator glory and honor and obedience, says Romans 1. And verse 20. In Romans 2, verses 14 to 15, the Bible speaks of the role of conscience in accusing or condemning the sinner who has never read the Bible. You see, God designed us to develop to a point where we could reason right from wrong, to develop a sense of morality. And when somebody knows in his conscience, I'm not an animal, then he shouldn't live like one. When he realizes that he is the creation of God, as every man eventually will, by common sense, that he is accountable to seek out the law and the word of the one in whose image he was created and to live by it. And thus the Apostle Peter says that when we are baptized, baptism is an appeal to God for a clean conscience. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. Certainly, that same level of spiritual and psychological thinking could look into the scripture and understand the full import and meaning of what God demands of us, and that we can do that, as the Apostle Paul said, the commandment comes to us. And when it comes to us, we're accountable to keep it. And from that point, if we ever fail in it, if we ever disobey God or do not do what He commands, then we're guilty of sin and bound for hell. So a little child is not accountable just because he has learned the plan of salvation. But listen, neither is an adult unaccountable just because he never bothered to learn the plan of salvation. It's not so much a matter of what you know, but it's a matter of what you can know. It's a matter of the heart and mind that comes through spiritual and intellectual maturity. Does the Bible give us any indication as to around what age a person typically reaches this stage of life? Yes, I believe it does. Some passages in the Old Testament show God holding people responsible for wrongdoing and expecting them to begin religious service if they are over 20 years old. You can read about that in Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, and Numbers 14, verses 29 through 32. So it certainly follows that at least by age 20, normally a person is held accountable by the Lord. But there are other passages that seem to set the age a little lower. For example, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 41 to 52, the Bible tells a story about Jesus getting lost in Jerusalem when he was 12 years old. 
You know, this is the only story in the Bible about Jesus between the ages of 3 and 30. And in this story, when his parents find him, he is in the temple talking with scribes and the teachers of the law. And he's astonishing everybody with his knowledge as he asks and answers questions uh, to these grown men. Now, when I was a younger person and I would read this story, I thought Jesus was working a miracle here. That he was showing a supernatural knowledge of the law. But you know that's not true. The book of John, chapter 2, tells us that the first miracle Jesus ever worked was when he turned water into grape juice at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee. This was not a miracle. This was just a smart kid. This was just a brilliant young man who had dedicated his life early to learning the word of God. And in verse 49, Jesus says to his parents, Why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? Now, there's some mystery about the meaning of this statement, but it seems that at age 12, Jesus had already begun to take very seriously his responsibilities to his heavenly father. But it's not only Jesus who gives us an example here. In the Old Testament, in 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 and 2, the Bible speaks of King Manasseh, who took the throne when he was 12 years old. The Bible says he did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before the children of Israel. Now, most scholars think when Manasseh was young, he was influenced by some wicked counselors, but the Bible says he did evil. God was holding him accountable and responsible for his actions. 12 years old. 1 Chronicles chapter 34, verses 1 through 3. We read about another king, King Josiah. Listen carefully what the Bible says about him. Josiah was 8 years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left, for in the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek the God of his father David. Now put that together. He started reigning when he was eight years old, and eight years later, he's 16, still young, the Bible says, and he begins to seek God and to do God's will, and God began to count him righteous. Look at another example from 2 Kings 2, 23-24. This is a difficult story, a challenging story in the Bible. Because the old translation makes it a little confusing. The story talks about Elisha the prophet. After Elijah had been caught up into heaven, and Elisha had taken over the prophetic office, he's going up to Bethel, and some people come out on the road. Now the old King James Version says some little children came out on the road, and they began to mock him and to say, Go up, bald head! Go up, bald head. Now, you know, more and more each passing year, I realize how much that hurts. But the truth is, it's more than just mocking the fact that he was an old man. That statement, go up, probably meant go up to heaven. Get out of this world, leave us alone, like Elijah did. He was really, uh, these, these people were blaspheming God by the statement. You know what the Bible says? Elijah did what every bald man wishes he could do. He whirled around and he pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord and two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of those again the old King James said little children. Well it's hard to think about that. Hard to wrap your mind around that but I think that's a poor translation. Little children. Some other English translations say youths. And in fact in the King James Version 27 times when this word is used, the same Hebrew word, the King James translates it, young men, which is much better. It, as we read the Bible, we find that this word speaks of people from teenage years, 12 to 15, all the way up into their 20s. It's used to describe Joseph when he was 17 years old in Genesis 37 too, and Solomon when he was a father. He was already married and having children of his own in 1 Chronicles 22 and verse 5. So these were probably teenagers, and even in their early 20s, who were mocking and slandering the prophet in this way. But the point is, 
They were in this period of life when their bad behavior caused God to judge them guilty and punish them with death. So when we put all of this together, we see the Bible recognizing accountability generally between the ages of 12 and 20. Maybe there's a young person in this building tonight, and you're in that window. You're between 12 and 20. You need to think about this. You need to listen very carefully and start thinking very seriously about the consequences of your actions because God is watching you. And he's beginning to notice you in a very special way and to take consideration of the things that you're doing. Now I hope that what we have learned tonight is that accountability is not something you have to work to achieve. It's not a badge of honor. Sometimes a, a young person can't wait to be baptized because he wants to lead a song, lead a prayer, or do something in the assembly. But that demonstrates maybe that young child is not yet accountable, doesn't really understand what baptism is all about. Accountability is something that is dreadful. It's not exciting. It's terrifying because it means you're not safe anymore. It means that now when you mess up, when you do wrong, you're going to have to answer for it. And doom and damnation and destruction is going to come to you. And that's very important as it concerns the plan of salvation. Baptism is a part of the plan of salvation in Mark 16, 16. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And that means that baptism is for lost sinners, innocent people, People that are safe and secure, they don't need to be baptized and it doesn't do them any good. I'm sure you know that in this world, most people who are baptized, in any sense of that term, are baptized as infants. And of course, we've already shown that infants have no sin. Infants don't possess the intellectual capacity to believe in God or to know the law or to understand the gospel. Maybe you've heard the term God parent. That's a word that's used mostly in the denominations that baptize the babies. You see, the godparent is an adult who comes up on behalf of the little baby who can't speak and makes a confession of faith for the baby. And the godparent makes the commitment that as that baby grows up, uh, they will teach the baby what has happened to them when they were little and I explained to them the significance of the ceremony after the little one grows. So these little boys and girls grow up and one day they're informed that without their knowledge or consent, they were put into a religious system. And this is what they're supposed to believe because of a commitment made by their caregivers when they were little. Now if you read your Bible, you know that that doesn't look anything like the New Testament picture of becoming a Christian. That looks nothing like the New Testament picture of obeying the gospel and being saved. Now I want to read to you from the book of Hebrews, chapter 8, verses 8 through 12. And this is actually a quote from the Old Testament from the book of Jeremiah. But I want to read how the writer of Hebrews says, Hebrews 8, beginning in verse 8. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers, in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because I did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know him, from the least of them, to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now what does this mean? Well in the old covenant a baby was circumcised when he was eight days old. And that didn't have anything to do with the forgiveness of sins because that baby didn't have any sin. But that was how a baby came into the old covenant. And as that child grew his neighbors and his brothers had to teach him to know the Lord, sort of like Godparents. They had to explain to him what that ceremony meant. But God says in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, there's not going to be any more need for Godparents 
or anything like them because everyone who's a Christian is going to know the Lord already. Why? Because only those who are old enough to sin and be lost and to believe and be baptized in that order will be Christians. And if you are a Christian, it's because you chose to be one. It's because you believed in Christ and you sought to obey God. Now I want you to think about what that means. When babies who are not lost are baptized, those babies are not saved because you can't save what isn't lost. If I throw you a rope tonight, that's not going to help you if you're drowning ten years from now. You can't save that which is not lost. But now years will pass, that baby will grow up and become an adult and eventually commit sin. And someone will come along and say, now hold on, you don't need to worry about getting baptized. Your mom and dad took care of that when you were little. You've already been baptized. And they'll go through life thinking they're okay. You see how devilish and deceptive and wicked this practice is, which men invented and not God? It undermines the gospel. Sometimes Christian parents who are very eager to see their little children become Christians can make the same mistake. And they can encourage their little ones to be baptized when they're far too young. But baptism is for lost sinners. And if we push or even allow a little one to be baptized before he's actually lost, then he's not actually saved. And he may never be. Only lost sinners who can truly from the heart believe on Jesus and obey Him willingly should be baptized, according to Acts 8 and verse 36. Baptism, you see, is a life-changing event. It is a decision to deny oneself, to put to death the passions and dreams we have, and to fully submit to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Only those, Jesus says, who are willing to love Him more than father and mother, brother and sister, son and daughter, even their own life, are ready to be His disciples. Matthew 10, 34 through 39. And that requires maturity. Maybe you tonight are at that point. You have the ability to make those mature decisions and to understand those concepts. Maybe you are in that age between 12 and 20 or maybe past it. God's Word indicates that a change is happening or has happened in your spirit, in your mind. You should know that God is going to start keeping a record of you, and He has been already for a little while. A record of the things you say and do. God is watching and listening and noticing every word you speak, every step you take, Every decision you make, every thought that you form and cultivate in your mind. And he's going to write that down in his book. And the Bible says one day the things that are written in that book are going to be brought up. And they're going to be compared against what the Bible says. And that's going to decide whether you go to heaven or hell. That's going to decide whether you are saved or whether you are lost. God has blessed you with the marvelous and challenging ability to think, to choose, to love or to hate, to bless or to curse, to build up or to tear down, to give life or to end life, to worship or to blaspheme, to obey Him or to disobey. God has given you the ability to listen to Him, to think about Him, or to ignore Him. God's not ignoring you. He's paying attention to you. And the Bible says one day, for every idle word that men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. Matthew 12 and 36. What is an idle word? It's the word that just sort of slips out. You don't even think about it. You forget it. You go on with life. But God doesn't forget. You'll give an account. You'll meet that word again. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account before Jesus that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 
I tell you, if I did not have Jesus, I read those words, I could not sleep at night. Because I would know that I was going to hell. I would know that I was lost. There are many things that I've done wrong that I don't even remember doing. And there are plenty I do remember doing. If I think all of those wicked, evil things are written down and I'm going to have to meet them again someday, that would make me so terrified that I could not have a moment's rest. And if that's you, you should not be at peace. You shouldn't be sleeping well. Because you've got to meet God someday. But I have good news. All of those sins, all of that record can be blotted out. Washed away. Erased. Removed. So that you never have to worry about it again. By the blood of Jesus Christ. Bible says in Acts 22 and verse 16 that when we are baptized, having faith in Jesus and having repented of our sins and confessed who Jesus is, when we're baptized, our sins are washed away. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, it says when we are baptized, we're buried with Christ. Baptized into his death, and when we come up out of the water, we come up with a new <coughs> All things have passed away. All things have become new. Does that sound appealing to you? Do you know you're a sinner? You realize God deserves more glory than you've given him? Do you realize that your life is full of things that if you don't get rid of them, if you don't deal with them, you're going to suffer in eternity for them? God has a plan to save you. If you know you're a sinner, this is not the time play. This is not the time to laugh. This is not the time to sleep. This is the time to run to Jesus and receive what only He can give. We can help you obey the gospel tonight if you come as we stand and sing.